Well, good morning, and I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm thankful you're here. I'm thankful that I can be here with you also. It's always good to come into the house of the Lord. And, and as y'all know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm in Augusta one day, Jenny's Florida the next, here, Claxton, just wherever the Lord leads me to come. And, uh, it's just always a joy wherever I go. But I'm thankful to be here this morning. Uh, I've looked forward to it, and uh, what can I, else can I say? Thank you all for being here. Pray the Lord's blessings upon you as, as we have gathered here together. I don't remember if I have preached a one of my series on the armor of God here or not. I started to look, because, but, but I'm in the midst of a series on the armor of God. And this morning, my text is going to be from Ephesians 6, verse 16, where we are told to take up the shield of faith. And this is only one of the pieces of that armor of God. But as we look at the shield of faith, we need to know how to use it, just like we need to know how to use, uh, put on the, uh, the, the boots of, of righteousness right, uh, and, and the other parts of it. Because we're going to be tested. If you haven't already been, you are going to be tested. And we need this armor, quote unquote, the armor of God. We need it in our spiritual lives every day as we walk in this earth. We need the whole armor of God. And like I said this morning, we're going to be looking at, at the shield of faith, but I'm going to begin my reading from Ephesians 6 and verse 10, where Paul, Paul writes there. Finally, my brethren, I wish you'd said my beloved, because when you say brethren, you indicate male. But the Lord inspired him to say brethren. Beloved includes male and female ladies. I don't want to leave you all out. Didn't I don't think that was his intent either. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's an important thing to remember as far as we, when we go, when we look at the parts of the armor of God. But we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. There, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with the truth and having the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench the fire, all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Will you pray with me? Most gracious God and our Heavenly Father, we give you all thanks in all things, O Lord, for you are are, are mighty in your mercies and, and, and grace and the blessings that you bestow upon thy people. So we come to thee, O Lord, who are, we, Lord, you're our creator. You have given us life. You've given us breath. You've given us a heart that supplies the blood to our bodies and the, and the, and the air that comes into our lungs. And we're so dependent upon you, Lord, and you are so merciful to give what you have given us. Father, as we come into your house this morning, my desire is to praise you, to give you glory. And I pray that that is the desire of each one who's gathered here today and wherever thy people might gather. Lord, continue to meet them with thy people when they come into thy house. And even, even as they sit along in, in their own homes and, and, and read thy word, Lord, just be with them. Be with us all in all cases. And Father, I pray your guidance this morning. 
that the words that I say would edify thy people and glorify you. So I ask that you be my helper, O oh Lord, this day again. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ, our the one who is our Lord and Savior, I ask. And amen. Now, before I look at the shield of faith, I want to take a brief look at what has gone on before in our text. We look at verse, the first three verses, verses 10 through 13. Paul is telling us that we're in a great spiritual battle against an enemy who is relentless and who is powerful. <coughs> verse 11 tells us that he is the devil. And he's also telling us that the devil will use all of his wiles to attack us. He fights dirty. This means he there's no whole bars and no holes barred in this match that that, uh, that he's bringing with us. He's going to use all of his dirty tricks. He's going to use his whatever schemes and whatever methods he has to destabilize our faith in an attempt to lessen the glory that we give to God daily. Now, in three of these verses, or three times in these verses, we are told to stand against these attacks. In Philippians, we're told that we have the strength to stand through Jesus Christ when Satan attacks us. But Paul goes on in here, he says, we are not to yield we're to stand. We're not to yield not even an inch to our attacker because you give him an inch, he's going to start taking away some of the blessings which you have in the Lord. Now the Lord has blessed his people mightily and by his spirit we have the truth. We have the, the, the truth. I started to say his truth. But his truth is truth and there's no other. We have salvation by his grace. We have his word, his written word. We have his love. We have his church and so much more. And Satan does not want us to have any of these spiritual gifts that come from the Lord. He doesn't. He tries to tell us, you don't need these gifts. You can get along fine without them. But we have them. And if it was in Satan's power, he would strip us of these. And those that he could, that, that he's not able to strip us of, he would do everything in his power to invalidate their use in our lives to, as we seek to glorify God. Beloved, we have got to stand, or if we're going to stand against these wiles of the devil, we do have to put on that full armor of God. We can't take up the sword of the Spirit and just that. You can't just put on the blessed plate of righteousness. You've got to put on the full armor of God. So this morning, I'm talking. To, I'm going to speak to you about the shield of faith. And I didn't arbitrarily just pick out the shield of faith for today, um, because I've already talked about three of them. I've, I've spoken about being girt about with the truth. I've already spoke, I've tried to preach on the having on the breastplate of righteousness. I've tried to uh, speak on having feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And the next one that follows in line is the shield of faith. I want to go back in history a little bit. Well, I want to go back at least 2,000 years. And I want to look at the shields that the Roman army used in, the time, in Paul's time. And I understand there were several different types. But there were two that were, from what I can understand, are mo were most commonly used. One would be a small round shield that they would use in hand-to-hand -hand combat. You might think you might think of the movies where you saw the uh, the gladiators fighting one another. They did, each one of them have a shield here and a sword here, and they would fight one another with it. But this is not the shield that. Uh, Paul is indicating here from the translations or the descriptions from the, uh, the Greek and the Roman that Paul is talking about. This shield that Paul is speaking of is a much larger shield. 
It would be about four and a half foot tall, or four foot tall and about two and a half foot wide. It was a heavy shield. I, when I was thinking about this, I said, the thought came to me, let's take a third of a 55-gallon barrel cut long ways. Cut that metal out the top and the bottom of it. And that's about what it would be. It would be curved like that. The sides would be curved. Uh, I would hold it and the sides would be curved around me. That it would give my entire body protection. And when the Roman soldiers would go into battle, they would march side by side with these shields in front of them. They would go into their little hundred fort fortresses that they had where they would gather together and just form 10 by 10 or even 100 by 100. Those shields would be side by side with each other on the out outer edge. But then on the inside, they would be sloped in the direction of, from the direction of the enemy so that when the enemy would fire the arrows into them, they would be deflected. They'd raise them up and slope where the arrows couldn't hit them in their heads. And you and I, as believers in Christ Jesus, need such a shield. But it's not a shield of wood. It's not a shield of iron nor a shield of leather. This is what if the 55-gallon drum that I described. That's something that man had made. But the scripture tells us that we need a shield of faith. Now faith, our faith is not found in a denominational doctrine or a statement of belief. Our faith is about believing in the Lord Jesus Christ who is our Savior. Faith is about putting our trust in the Lord who has not only saved us eternally, but he has grounded us, who, has, he's, who strengthens us, who calms us when necessary. He has established us, and it is by him whom we grow in spirit and truth. Faith is a necessary, non-negotiable component of our Christian life. Without our gift of God-given faith, we would not be among those saved. Ephesians 2 and 8 and 9, that we love so well, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So our faith, our faith is one of the stones on which our Christian lives are built. Our faith is what sustains our Christian lives. Our faith is a constant believing that God is, and when we believe that God is, our faith pleases God. Hebrews 11 and 6 tells us, but without faith it is impossible to please God, or to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, all men, all men have a form of faith. Let's call it an everyday faith. I have this everyday faith. I exercise this everyday faith. Faith this morning as we were coming over here. I had faith that my vehicle was going to get here. I had faith that the, the, the bridges coming over the Canoochee River were not were going to be there and that they would not fail. We go through tunnels, trusting, having faith that they are well constructed, that won't fall up, uh, fall in, in on us while we're traveling through them. We trust in electricity, we trust our automobiles, we trust. Well, some of y'all might trust airplanes. Uh, we trust ships and buses. We believe that these are safe. And our faith in these things are well-founded because they have been proven over and over again. But the faith that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ is over and above any of these things. Or at least it should be. 
our faith in the triune Godhead, Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, is faith in the one who cannot fail. Our faith is in the person who is omniscient, omnipotent. Uh, did I say that right? Omnipotent or omnipotent. I think it's omnipotent. And our faith in the God of heaven our faith in the God of earth is never misplaced. Romans 8 and 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now our faith, our faith is going to be challenged. Our spiritual walk on the earth is going to be attacked. I say challenged at one point. I need to strengthen that. It's more than being challenged. It's under an attack. And I, I, you know I've used that word. But we're under attack because of the work of Jesus Christ in our lives. And our faith in, in, in him is necessary as we seek to stand in our service to Christ. Our faith, our shield of faith is a connection to God. And the use of this shield of faith protects us when those fiery darts of the wicked are, hit, are, 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 are pointed to us or are hurled at us. In Paul's time, and even up into the time of gunpowder, one of the most potent uh, weapons that they had was, was arrows. Uh, they used them in, in, over in, in, in the Middle, in the East, and in the Europe, and and, and as you have watched our Western movies, you will, you'll see, you've seen the Indians shooting flaming arrows into the forts of, of, of the military, trying to burn them down. Now these arrows, they would be, or the tips of the arrows rather, would be wrapped in pieces of cloth and, and they'd be soaked in pitch of some nature. This would be then set on fire and, and then the, they would fire that, arrow into, toward their enemies, or toward us, rather. Satan would be firing them toward us. Now, the pitch on that arrow was intended to spatter, you know, just to scatter everywhere whenever it, uh, whenever it hit the target. And that when it did that, that pitch would ignite everything that it touched or, or bounced onto. And the shields in Roman times, those shields would were defensive against this type of attack. A metal shield would, would just deflect them off. And if the shields were of wood, they would be covered with leather that had been soaked in water before the battle. And this would be able, and, and that they would be able to quench the flames and there would be no spatter. And these shields used in that way would protect the soldier. Now, Satan's most fiery darts toward us are those of temptations. He started with Eve and has tempted her descendants ever since. He even tempted, tried to tempt the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will tempt you and I today. Now, some of the darts that Satan uses are immorality, hatred, envy, anger, Covetousness, envy, fear, despair, distrust, doubt, pride, and any other thing that you might can come up with. And each dart has the potential to damage our walk with the Lord. But the shield of faith is to be our defense in that we use it to deflect or quench those fiery darts. Again, why do we need this armor? 
Why do we need, in particular, this shield of faith? Look at yourselves in the mirror. Or think about look, sit, look at, as you look at yourself in the mirror. As you observe yourself, do you realize or will you acknowledge that just under the skin, we all have lusts that are ready to be ignited? All it needs is a small spark, a small flame, for that bit, a little bit of, of, of pitch to become a, a, a raging fire within us. Satan's fiery darts are designed to ignite those, those lusts and, their, and the sins that follow. And I'm going to speak from experience, experiences in my own life. And I believe that there may be some others here who have witnessed this and others and perhaps have experienced them themselves when in anger, you said or did something that you shouldn't have and did not glorify God through your actions. And in essence, that little spark became a flamethrower. And when this happens, and again, I'm guilty here, don't I try to justify my actions to you? Well, if so-and-so hadn't have done this, I wouldn't have done this. That's, that doesn't justify the wrong that I did. Why not? Because God has given me instructions and, with, and given me words of admonishment to keep me from doing things as such. I just want to look at 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4 and read verses 3 through 8 for an example. And Paul writes again there, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, I apologize again, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner, because that, the Lord, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God has not called us unto uncleanliness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God who has given us his Holy Spirit. So our believing and trusting God and his word is our shield, our shield of faith, whenever those fiery darts come our way. Satan, Satan's desire is to defeat our witness. And he's going to use those darts, those uh, that I mentioned just a while, ago, a while ago, to tempt us to sin. And if we sin, it's probably, it's probably because we may have momentarily or we may have just set our minds against it, that we're going to doubt God and his ability to provide. And I'll tell you this, if we doubt God's ability to provide, we doubt God, we doubt his word, and this leads to unbelief. He that believeth on the Son of God hath a witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. That's 1 John 5 and 10. And if we say that we don't believe God, this is harsh now, if we say that we don't believe God, then in a sense we are calling God a liar. We're saying that he cannot be trusted to do what he said he would do. When we do that, Satan just grins just as broad as he can because he has accomplished one of his goals. And that goal was to cause us to doubt God, to sin against God, and cause us to try and again justify our actions, our unbelief. 
all that in action. This is a trap that Satan has set for us. He wants us to doubt the one true and living God, and he wants us to put our faith in him. And beloved, there can be no good that comes out of trusting Satan. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden. I want to look at Genesis chapter 3 in just a moment. I don't know about y'all's Bibles, but mine, my pages stick together so bad. Beginning in verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Conversation's fine right to that point. Here comes the temptation and the lies and temptation. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Temptation there, he's tempting her. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the, to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one, one wise. She took of the fruit. She lusted after that fruit. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave unto her husband with her, and he did eat. This was the first recorded dark that Satan sent to mankind. Since that time, there have been countless arrows fired at the people of God, all from the same fire of temptation. And he tempts us today just as he tempted Eve back then. Again, he tried to tempt Jesus in, in, in the wilderness. But the Lord deflected those darts with the word of God, with the shield of faith, even as we should be def deflected. Now, we do have the ability to stand against the, act, the attacks of the wicked one. And we are to stand with the shield of faith, deflecting those guards, dressed again in the whole armor of God. And we, you and I, as we stand together, we are to have our shields butted once one against the other. As we stand side by side, we are to form a wall that those fiery darts cannot penetrate. Proverbs 30 and 5 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. So I've had several descriptions of, the, of the, what the shield is. And I've got a quote here I want to share from you from a man that I read behind occasionally. Uh, his name's Alan Carr. So he says this is what the shield of faith is. The shield of faith is simple trust in God. It's taking God at his word. It's believing him in all things. It's putting God and his will ahead of everything else in life so that Satan, so that when Satan launches his fiery darts at us, we'll be able to stand and hold up the shield of faith and watch them, meaning those arrows, all fall harmlessly to the ground. <coughs> Continuing, the shield of faith, which is a simple childlike faith and trust in the Lord, is a shield that the arrows of Satan cannot penetrate. That shield will protect you here, and like the ancient soldiers who were slain in, ancient Roman soldiers who were slain in battle and carried off the field on their shields, the shield of faith 
will carry us home to glory and bring us into the presence of the Lord. End quote. So in closing, I'm going to ask, and I include my, myself needing to answer this question. Are we standing protected by the shield of faith? Are we fixed and established in the truth which God has given us? Are we ready for the attacks of the enemy? Are we standing in the whole armor of God holding the shield of faith? Beloved, I pray that we are. And may God bless us as we go forward in his kingdom. And what is our invitation hymn?